This conference, this conference will now be recorded. This conference will now be recorded. Okay, let me rephrase that again. We're gonna. This conference gonna... will now be recorded. <laughs> okay, can I start? Yeah, you can start now. We're gonna be talking about speaking and community involvement today. Um, something I'm very passionate about, something that uh, if anybody that knows me, I've done this for quite a while now. So I really wanted to get a new presentation out and this is honestly my first time giving this one. So understand if I make a few mistakes or if I change a few things up, but I wanted to get something out there that really talked to the community and how to get good presentations. So this is basically combining a couple stories about the community and what's out there and speaking 101. So the second half of this, really, we're going to talk about exactly what you need to do for abstracts, for presentations, for standing up here and speaking, all of those things. But the first part is all going to be about community. Okay. So to talk about myself a little bit, if my clicker wakes up, maybe, there we go. Okay. So talk about myself a little bit. So the other thing key about this too is that this presentation is actually designed to teach you about presentations. So on purpose, I make some mistakes inside here as well. I do some things that are stuck inside this presentation. Feel free to call me out on them if you feel that it's one of those things. If you've presented many times before, it's a great thing to say, hey, um, why would you ever do that? And tell me about it and tell me what you think. I like all of my sessions to be discussions. So always you can interrupt me at any time while I'm presenting. I want you to come and talk to me. I want you to say, hey, I don't agree with this, or here's another idea. So when I get into the topics about, hey, let's talk about day before prep, what you should do, what you should not do, all of those things. If you have presented before, please let me know what you suggest as well. How many people have presented to a user group before? Okay, good number, not bad. How about a nerd lunch or a brown bag lunch at work or something like that, just something small? Okay, few of you, but not everybody, okay. So, all right, so let's get started. Also, um, obviously about me, I've been doing database work for a long time, um, probably too long, I should really, Think about becoming a bartender or something and stop doing this. Um, I take a lot of pictures. You'll see some of those today in the slides. And then if you want to rate me on this presentation, just if you scan that barcode, you'll be able to go to there and give me a review on, on what you think. And we'll talk all about reviews here in just a minute. So I really want to start with why should you care about speaking and community involvement? Okay. I get this all the time that people come to me and say, I don't ever want to speak. This is the hardest thing in the world to do is to stand up here and speak and I'm scared of it. I can't do it. Why should I bother? So I'm going to tell you a story <laughs> and this will, this will relate very well to what you just said, Paul. So, so imagine this, it's about 2005, somewhere right around the mid 2000 area. I'm uh, working away at this little tech company that had grown very quickly. It was one of those startups, you know, they didn't have the money, they were raising money, everything else. We were about 50 contractors at one point in time and then we grew to about 250. They brought us on all full time and we're just working away. I mean, long hours. We were working sometimes into three or four in the morning sometimes and still getting up and going into the office at eight or nine the next morning. So we had all sorts of things where we were really, really invested in this community. I mean, this company. And this was a time when it wasn't AWS or anything else. We were building data centers. We built one in American Fork and we built one in Salt Lake City you know, by Big Cottonwood Canyon. We literally, yes, put racks, <laughs> computers, everything else. So it was a, not only an interesting time where I learned all of these great things, but it was a time that we used to say it's like walking on broken glass. Because what happened was after we brought the 250 people on and we were there, we started to shed a little bit. Just like all internet um, bubble companies and all startups, what happens if you don't have the money? Well, people start to get laid off. So first quarter of the year, we had a little meeting and a meeting where all these people came together and we lost about 60 people. Well, that's a huge thing. I mean, you lose about 60 people and you're like, okay, now hold on. <laughs> you're only a company of 250, you lose 60 people, that's a lot. And that's people next to you too. That's the other DBAs you work with. That's the other developers, that's everything. They told us, okay, we're steering the ship. We're changing what we're doing. We're going forward. We're gonna be okay. Next quarter, we lost 40 people. So then you're like, okay, now what am I doing? What am I doing? And I actually, at that point in time, applied for another position actually and was awarded, if I wanted to leave for a DBA, another DBA position. My boss convinced me, no, no, you've gotta stay. You've gotta, you've gotta, you gotta really gotta stay with me for this. You know, we gotta do this. So next quarter, another 30 people left. <laughs> 
and then the following quarter another 40 people until it really it came down to about 25 people and there was two DBAs my boss and myself and in the end I was laid off and so it's something that you've never really experienced if you've never really experienced the layoff it's something that's very not only disheartening but it's like okay am I not good enough am, is this what it should be and then what do you do what do you do so for me personally I like to work on old cars and at the time I had an old 1976 Maverick I went home that day in the morning because they let us go very early in the morning and I worked on that car all day that's all I didn't make a single phone call I didn't answer the call I didn't open a computer I just worked on my car it was just kind of my time to relax and do something different the next day I said okay now I've got to start talking to my network got to start figuring this out and I got to go and find another position luckily at that time I was starting up a user group and I could hit up a lot of other people that were in the users group and say, hey, I'm looking, or I'm trying to find a position or something else. And so I was able to get a position rather quickly because of that, because of my community. So that's one of those stories that you really don't want to ever go through in life, but it happens, okay? And so, and as I'm going through this, I'm gonna pull up some pictures. I will talk all about the pictures in a minute, but for right now, they're just gonna come up every once in a while. <laughs> so, so that's my that's kind of my layoff story of that that situation too. Things that you don't ever want to happen to you and you don't think they ever will. Don't get me wrong, everyone here believes they cannot be fired and they cannot be laid off. Trust me, <laughs> that can happen to anyone. Um, yeah, to take away your your concentration, everything else, your confidence and everything else. So my suggestion there, my biggest suggestion there is always if you have your community around you, then you're ready to go. You're ready to go out to the next step. And you say, okay, you write your community and you say, hey, I got laid off. Who's out there hiring and what else? And since if you've been up here presenting and talking and communicating, like I'm going to talk about here in a minute, then you're already ready to go. So don't wait. Do it now. I'm trying not to be doom and gloom here, but that's this is a reality that we all face. Okay, so the next... The next thing I want to talk about now is events. You heard me mention things like Wizarding Days, Comic Con, Utah Geek Events. Everybody that knows me knows I've put on a lot of events, okay? <laughs> I'm somewhere to the tune of 35 or 40 at this point in my life. So I'm known at other events too. When I go to an event, I see people, I hug them, I say hi, I say, how's it going? So I was at this event back in July and, and it was kind of a questionable event. It was called FearCon. Anybody been to FearCon? FearCon was really, really cool. If you are into the macabre and the horror and everything, FearCon should be your mecca to go to. I mean, it's a really, really awesome conference. But this year, they kind of put it out in this industrial area. So you're driving out here, and you're like, okay, where are we going? <laughs> you know? This is how we die. Yeah, this is how we die, exactly. <laughs> you're like, okay, there's just a problem here. I mean, nobody can find it, and there, there's parking, there's cars everywhere, and they actually usher you off into the curb I mean I had to drive over the curb you know and I'm like I've got a little car you know so I'm like okay and we go into the dirt and we're parking in the dirt and I'm like this isn't the greatest of experiences but then I get up to the door and luckily enough and I, I go okay I need to purchase three tickets I was with my kids and um, the gentleman looked at me he's like oh Pat how you doing it's good to see you it's been so long and he handed me three badges and I said wait wait I gotta purchase these he goes no you're good go ahead he knows that from all the different community and all the different events and stuff like that, there's things that, that come back from that. And that's part of your community. That's part of what's giving back. And I did the same thing, actually. I've done the same thing for him several times, too. So it's not that this is a rule or anything. It's an unwritten rule. Giving of yourself into the community makes all the difference in the world, and it changes you know, that dynamic. It makes it easier for those things. Now, again, don't ever think that you're going to get more than you give. <laughs> Greg, Greg looks at me funny right now. He's like, he's like, you're gonna kill me. Yes. Yes. There's a simple rule that it's great that you give and give and give. You will not receive all of that back, but every once in a while you will receive what you need, and that's that's very important. You know, when those jobs come up or when those things come up, you're going to find that that sort of situation. So, I'm gonna tell one more story really quick because I think I have enough time. The last story is about Italian food. How many people like Italian food? Okay, good, good. How many people like macaroni grill? Okay, good. You need to like macaroni grill, um, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> so, so again, way back into the 2000 era, um, I was working at this nice, wonderful company that's represented here tonight. Um, <laughs> but it was, it was. Uh, <laughs> 
I was, I was not really looking around, let's say, okay? But I had been putting on conferences, code camp and things like that. I had been presenting, I'd been standing up doing the same thing. And a gentleman hit me up at one of these code camps and he said, you've got to come help us with this situation. We have these clusters going wrong, we have these replication scenarios going wrong, we have all these problems with SQL Server, you've got to come help. And I said, well, I'll gladly come help. I sat down with my code camp, I spent an hour or so talking about the solution, what needs to do, okay, can you come in and help us? And I said, sure. We went, out to, we went out to the offices and I kind of gave some suggestions some more. Funny enough, it was about May 15th or so, I'm sitting at my parent-in-law, I mean my mother-in-law's house and we're, we're having a little party and something like that and he calls me. I'm like, why are you calling me? He's like, we just crashed and I need your assistance. Now, keep in mind, I am not contracted with this company. I am not NDA'd, I am not anything else. He called me and said, I need you to help me. I'm like, I, I can't VPN, I can't, you know, what do you want me to do? And so he's like, just get on the call and help us. And so we started to talk more and more. I got on the call and I tried to assist where I could. I don't even know their system fully, you know, I'm just trying to give out hints and things like that. So fast forward to the next conference. And at that time, I was once again doing another SQL presentation. And here's where it becomes really funny is that my interview process became going to lunch. Okay, so I stopped interviewing a long time ago and he invited me, he's like, look, I want you to come work for me, come, come to lunch. He was downtown, I was in um, South Jordan. So he said, well, let's meet at Macaroni Grill at Fashion Place Mall. Nice middle of the road place, right? Well, there's two important things about Macaroni Grill. One, I love Italian. <laughs> two, it has papers on the table and crayons. Did you, did you not know this? Do you know how many database diagrams I've diagrammed out on Macaroni Grill's tables? I mean, it's like, the greatest whiteboard ever. <laughs> You've got to try this out. If you haven't done this, go to lunch with somebody and say, look, this is how a database works and so forth, so or something else, whatever interests you. But I used it to show him how his architecture should look. And I literally drew it out on the screen. I mean, on this table. So he comes to me and then he says, the CTO says, okay, we gotta meet as well. And so we meet the CTO, same thing, macaroni grill, but downtown this time. <laughs> and I do the exact same thing. CTO loves it. He's starting to draw too as well, because he's a, he's a diehard engineer and he was starting to add to it and say, no, we need to do this. So then the interview process came. And the interview process for this company was <laughs> kind of funny. I, I, I ran Utah Geek, I mean, Code Camp at the time. And I had a session on SQL performance tuning. So this boss took his entire development staff, and I mean all 17 software engineers, and they were sitting in my session. They were all wearing the same shirts <laughs> so that I knew exactly who they were. And they were all asking me questions about what I knew about SQL Server. <laughs> and so the session became my interview, essentially. I was standing up there presenting to them to be my interview as well and to go work for them. And after that, they're all like, yeah, you need to hire him. <laughs> it was that simple. So the point of that, that story too as well is that interviewing is something you do all the time. Um, Andrea and I were just talking about this and when we just said about the jobs, people come to you when you're standing up here because you're standing up here. You may not know absolutely the answer to every question. Don't get me wrong, you never will. There will be someone in the audience that knows more, but that doesn't mean they're not gonna be seen as the expert. You're going to be seen as the expert. So standing up here is a career defining thing that will help you moving forward. And even more than that, even the money and anything else, even more than that is you're giving back to the community. That's what's most important. Building up other people and helping the community, that's the most important. Okay, so I told you I would tell you about the pictures. Um, so I fretted and fretted over this. I, I rewrote this. This presentation is new from about two and a half weeks. I've presented it now to, the, to an empty room two or three times, and I fretted over these pictures. I could not figure out a good way to say layoff and <laughs> Italian food and something else. So I finally said, you know what? I'm gonna put all of my, some of my favorite pictures right now that I have taken of goals that I have met. So these are places that I wanted to go and I achieved because I had the ability to do all these other things in the community and speak, okay? I met goals. This is the crack in the subway in Zion's National Park. It's an extremely difficult hike. I did it in 2008 and it nearly killed me. I did it again in November and it nearly killed me again. <laughs> I may actually do it again, but we'll see about that. <laughs> but that's one of my favorite pictures. It took me 10 years to get that photo right there because I took it the first time and I failed. It was blurry, it was messed up, it went wrong. I did not go back for 10 years, but that's a good goal and that's how I get to it. 
The other picture, same things, These, that's Bell's Canyon. That one on the far right, the waterfall, was a fun one because I fell in that waterfall. I was trying to cross it and I actually fell, hurt my legs, scraped them up and actually lost my glasses. That was a wonderful, wonderful hike back down that trail. Um, so, and then the last one are Kelpies. Does anybody know what a Kelpie is? No, Kelpie is a mystical creature in the land of Scotland that comes out of the water in the shape of a horse head. And they actually steal your children. It's not a very pleasant thing, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a, Kelpies are, I mean, Scotland, Scottish are very superstitious and they have things like this. These are 35 feet tall and they're in a park in Scotland. And I finally got to go to Scotland this year where I've always wanted to go and had a wonderful time. And so that was another goal that I reached. So I may change these pictures up. You, you may not see this next time I present this because I'll figure out what works with layoffs and Italian dinner or something else. But I liked this idea. I could not fret over these pictures anymore. I kid you not how long the slide was blank. It was at least four or five days. It was just sitting there staring at me and I'm like, I can't figure it out. Okay, so the other big, big important thing you have to have to get out in that community is 20 seconds of courage, okay? Does anyone know, not the picture, but does anyone know the phrase 20 seconds of courage, where it comes from? I'm a huge movie buff, yes? I can see him saying it. Who said it? Brad. Brad Pitt? Yeah. Yep. In uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Nope. Oh. I bought a zoo. Oh. Now, the reason none of you know this is it wasn't a very good show. <laughs> <laughs> most people probably didn't really know the show. But the line is the most important. And the most important thing about it is the story behind it. So it took him 20 seconds of courage to walk across the room and to ask his uh, future wife if she would like to go out on a date or for her phone number or something like that. It took him 20 seconds of courage. He teaches his kid this idea that that one little thing can change your life to show you all these beautiful things that we got out of life, your kids and everything else. So the reason I suggest 20 seconds of courage is because right now you're sitting in a chair and someone next to you, you may not know them at all but it takes 20 seconds of courage to talk to them about the session you're in, about the event you're at, about something else. Everyone that you're sitting next to has something in common. You're all here to listen to me, <laughs> or you're into databases, or you're an employee of some company or something. You have something in common. So just asking that one question can change everything. Yes, Steve. Um, so, okay, it's really a challenge to even commit to talking. Once you commit to talking, you then your brain starts freaking yes. out. But when you start talking, typically the thing you're talking about, you have some form of passion about. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as you start talking, it's just, <laughs> and then. It's a uh, steamroll like, effect. I can't believe it's been two hours. I just kept on rambling and rambling. And everyone's like, that was so great. And you're like, what did I even say? So the seconds to get up there and the seconds to submit, it's worth it. Yeah. it it is great. Yep. So, and the important part about that is it does become a steamroller. Once you get there, you start to talk more and more and so forth and so on. You do have to improve after that. Obviously, if you're just sitting there spewing things out for 20 minutes, that's not good. But it's the little baby steps you have to take. The first step for everybody that's, that's in any event you go to, any meetup, any conference event, anything else is to talk to the person next to you. It will change your life. I'm not going to tell the story of pass because it takes too long, but trust me, it, it makes all the difference in the world. So 20 seconds of courage. So how do you get to that 20 seconds of courage? This part is also a little bit about some books that I've recently read. If anybody would like to know, it's called um, How to Change Anything. Um, it's by, uh, I can't remember the names. They're a group actually that live in Alpine, Utah. They're the same ones that did Influencer. Um, I can't remember the name of the... Remy? What? Brandy is the last thing we want. Brandy? Yeah, maybe. Maybe it is. Five yeah, yeah, five authors. You're right. We had one come speak, too. Like I said, my friend is a friend with one of the authors. So Vital they're smarts. Vital Smarts. Yeah, they're here. So, but How to Change Anything is a, is a great, great book to talk about things like this. So, the most important thing is what Steve mentioned as well passion. Whatever you are passionate in, talk about. And whatever you're passionate in, tell others. That's what's most important. Passion helps you to go to that next step, no matter what. If you're passionate about something, you'll talk about it. That's why I'm up here today. I'm passionate about getting you to speak. <laughs> um, and I'm tired of speaking, no. <laughs> this one is, this one's actually, the second line on here is for Andrea. It's called, pause the introvert. <laughs> and 
This is actually because she has 100% said many times, she goes to the past conference, she interacts and talks to people and she gets very tired. The introverts out there, which is many of you, I can tell you right now, are very tired after social interaction. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with you. You just have to find whatever works for you in that situation. You have to pause for a little while to do what's necessary, and then you can go back to your introverted nature, whatever that is. Whatever you need to do, find what that is. So pause the introvert. When you go to an event specifically, that's when you need to pause that person. I used to call this coming out of my shell when I was at pass. I would tell myself in my head, it will make all the difference in the world if I talk to the person next to me. And that's how I tell myself to do it. Last one is directly out of how to change anything. Um, there's this study called the willpower test. It's about kids and marshmallows. And if you haven't seen it, please go out and take a look at YouTube or whatever else. It's been talked about many times. The kid will wait longer to eat the marshmallow. And that determines how much willpower they have. I do not believe that at all. I do not believe anything that has to do with willpower, unfortunately. Because, and my girlfriend tells me this all the time. She says, how do you have the willpower to only sleep two hours at night and then still get up at six o'clock in the morning? I said, well, I gotta take a kid to school. <laughs> it's not willpower, it's logic. <laughs> you know, there's no, there's no willpower here. It's just requirement. Um, so I try to tell people that all the time when they say, gosh, you've got so much will to stand up there and to pause the introvert and do those things. I'm like, no, 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 no. I say in my head the right things I need to say to make a difference about what I'm about to do. I learn to love what I hate, is the phrase they always use. And the way you do that is you say nice things about it, essentially. <laughs> Instead of saying that it's a terrible time that you're gonna have, no, I'm gonna have an amazing time because I'm gonna meet someone that I can work with in the future, or something to that nature. That's the difference, is how you look at it, not your amount of willpower. And please, if anybody tells you that it's willpower, say no, it's not willpower. <laughs> I do not have a lot of willpower. I've been binge watching Stargate Atlantis for like a week and I can't stop. That's that's not willpower, <laughs> okay? I've been stuck watching it and I can't stop. Trust me, I don't have willpower. Do SGU next. Uh, I already did it. I, the original I did. I did it years ago. I just, I got into Atlantis and yeah. And if anybody's in love with Jason Momoa, he's on the show all the time, so, you know. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I don't care, <laughs> but um, all right. So those are the steps that you really got to focus on coming through this. Now, the rest of this presentation is basically all about all the technical aspects and all the things you need to do to present and speak to others, the, the abstracts, the talking about it, all the prep and things like that. So this is really, I don't want to say the soft skills part of it, but in other words, the touchy feely part of it or anything like that. This is what you first have to get over. Because again, I know most database and technical people are introverted people. It's simple as that. <laughs> but those times and those, those worlds are different now. I mean, you ask anyone in the community, who works 100% alone? Nobody. <laughs> you all have to work on a team. You all have to work with other people. Working with other people means that you have to pause the introvert from time to time. You might as well make it an advantage to you to do that. So finding ways to get up and speak and talk. Okay, all right, so communities. Where can you go out and find some of these things and do some of these things? So Meetup is by far one of the biggest communities out there. I mean, they really have taken over users groups, essentially. Besides some other organizations, and I mentioned these technology-focused groups, PASS, um, .NET has some, Postgres has some, Oracle has some, the Oracle users groups, all those things, those are the technology-focused groups I'm talking about but they all use Meetup. <laughs> so Meetup should be your best friend. If you have not gone out to Meetup and just searched for tech and you do it in a range of SLC like 100 miles, you'll literally find I think 125, maybe even 130 users groups at this point. Yeah, it's insane. Now, they may not all be terribly active, but joining them and then starting to get involved with them, that's the important part. So find what you are interested in. You can quickly become oversaturated. <laughs> Um, just look at my meetup anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Running four of them doesn't help either. But um, so you can become oversaturated. So find what you really want to focus on and find those communities that you really feel like you get something out of. Um, some of them, if sometimes it's large though too. Like the Java users group sometimes used to have 200 people at it. I mean, is that an effective users group for you when you're, excuse me, when you're just trying to get started? Uh, maybe not. Maybe something smaller would be better. It's all a decision on what you want to do. 
but find meetups that work for you. And don't be afraid to do non-technical meetups. <laughs> I'm a member of Utah Outdoors, several other things for hiking and for walking. You have a life besides that computer. <laughs> So use it for those things as well. And you can always meet people too. We went on a Utah Outdoors hike and somebody came from uh, Sacramento and she was in town and she was just hiking and she was a software developer as well. And so, you know, you just run into all sorts of people and that's always a good thing. Um, Eventbrite's got some options. Slack, there are some communities that are just on Slack. Um, Elixir, um, I think there's a few Oracle Slack channels. There's Geek Events, there's Pass. Pass has a Slack now, doesn't it? Yeah. So Slack is a great way to communicate after the meeting or you know before the meeting, anything like that. Connect with people. Don't be afraid to send a message and say, hey, I found this, or hey, I'm looking into this. Can you help me? I get messages all the time from people on Meetup and on Slack asking me, where should I go? What user group should I attend? What should I do after college? Things like that. I'll answer those. I'll answer them all day long. And you should as well, whatever those experiences are, because it helps people out. You also use the Twitter. Uh, Twitter has a bunch of hashtags, like SQL yeah. help. And I mean, you'll get really good you know, responses, let's right? Call them popular yeah. authors and, and community people that just troll it all day long. Yeah. Uh, that's a good point, is that if you tweet and send out Twitter messages, you'll get responses if you if you get them into those communities and where they are. The, there's lots of communities out there to help you, and so finding one is not that difficult. You're in one right now. I'm sure you're in one for your house and other things like that too, your um, church, your schools. There's all sorts of communities. Be involved in some of them, any of them, to get you used to that situation. Okay, so let's talk about actually presenting. Let's talk about what we actually need to do. The first thing we kind of need to do is we need to prep for it. As a matter of fact, I think these are out of order. No, there it is. What happened to that? And we need to do an abstract. So this is why I haven't practiced this enough. Um, we need to do an abstract. So what do you have to do for your abstract? You don't have to write a 10-page paper. <laughs> now, if you're going to an academic conference, yes, you do. But please do not do an academic talk as your first talk. Please. Unless you're in college. <laughs> Go right ahead, but if you're not, don't do it. You're, you're laughing because you're like, yeah, you agree with me. <laughs> you what? You're used to it. Exactly, exactly. But trust me, once you go to the technical conferences on the outside, it's a lot easier. <laughs> My friend Kirk, who works at the U and has to do grants and projects and everything else, I mean, he literally writes five-page abstracts to present somewhere. And I'm like, yeah, I can't do that. <laughs> you need a good description a good set of information that tells people what they're going to get. And most importantly, as, as Brent Ozar has kind of taught us over the years, is who should not be in the class? You want to tell people you should not be in this class. Okay, if you are a developer and you only work on Python and I'm doing a session on SQL Server Performance Tuning, you shouldn't be in this class. It's that simple. Because the reason is, is because if you get those people into the class, all they're going to do is say this was a bad presentation because it wasn't what they expected. The better you can say this is what you can expect and this is who you should be in this class, the better off you are. And at the end of this slide, I mean, at the end of this deck, I have resources that links off to Brent Ozar's post about this exact thing. He's compiled quite the list over the years of a lot of really good presentation ideas. And so I linked it to the bottom, at the bottom of resources. So right for the audience. Definitely proofread and spell check it, um, okay? Yeah, it's simple as that. Have someone else read it, someone else spell check it. Do not expect whatever you're submitting it to to actually spell check it, it won't. I run a lot of different events and none of them spell check their forms. So do that first beforehand, write them up. Um, typically what I do is I actually have a Google Doc with five or six presentations and abstracts sitting inside it and I just keep them in there, and then I edit them whenever I need to, and that's how I submit them into their abstracts. Once you've done one or two presentations, it's very easy to keep them compiled together, essentially. It's when you do 15 or 20 that it becomes a nightmare, but hopefully you're not gonna get right to that. Um, the other big thing I got here is write, make the summary, the short description clear. So almost everyone is doing um, less paper, which is good, we don't, we don't want more paper, but that means that the description is gonna be on your phone. And people are going to be looking at that for the schedule. And they're just going to be looking at this little thing. If you have, this is how you set up replication for SQL Server 2015 R2 in Azure. <laughs> that's a little long. So we want to we wanna do something that's not 
too catchy, but something that's descriptive, something that works, okay? The reason I chose my name for this presentation was it wasn't too long and it said exactly what it was looking for, all right? Don't do too many inside jokes either. <laughs> so the Pass Summit has a very, very well-known um, culture and we know a lot of different things about a lot of different people, but don't put that into a description because they also get five or 6,000 brand new people every year. And if they don't know that, they're not gonna attend the session. So you gotta be very careful about your sessions. Also, a lot of a new thing in the events is that a lot of people are voting just off the abstract and the su submission and not off the person. Open West does this where you can do it off the topic and the suggestion, but not the person at all. So if they have that, then you're just voting on an idea. So you gotta make sure that idea sounds good and it's something that people want. That has its pros and cons. Yes, Steve. I mean, just to reiterate, your summary should be very practical, yeah. really concise, because when you submit it and there's 20 people looking at it and there's like three paragraphs and there's no one through it, you're like, okay, I don't care. I don't yeah, care. I don't care. right, right. It's got to be. It could be the best conference session ever, Yep. but they're passing because they're not getting through the submission. Right, data. yeah. And like I said, and there's pros and cons. Whenever I go to a conference, I like to know the speaker and the topic because sometimes I will attend a conference session just for the speaker, because some people are so great of speakers, I could care less what they're talking about, I just wanna hear them talk. And part of that's because I do a lot of talks and so I wanna learn, but part of that's also just because I'm gonna learn something because of the way they present, simple as that. So it's pros and cons. Again, sometimes it's great if a conference says, we're just going off of the technical topic and that's it. Sometimes it's good if you have both the person and the technical topic. It all depends on the conference. And it's up to the organizers to decide that. It's not up to the, well, the community can decide if they hate it, then they can tell them. Okay. This thing keeps going. Did I go? Yeah, now we're on prep. Preparing for it. Now, you've got this idea, you've got this abstract, you've got this thing. First of all, another big thing is too, is all you need is the abstract. Most conferences are four or five months away. Well, except for mine, but... <laughs> But usually it's four or five months away. So you can get an idea, an abstract and say, I'm gonna present on this, but then not have the session actually written. Um, it's not uncommon to do. As a matter of fact, I just did it. I have one on Postgres logical replication that I haven't completed the actual presentation, but I have the abstract and the idea done and I've submitted it and it'll be a presentation. So you have time, but during that time, this is what you have to start figuring out is how to do those things. So don't be afraid to submit an abstract that you don't actually have the full presentation for. Like I said, after doing it a few times, you're gonna have them saved up. Um, most important on prep, what I like to do is tell a story. As you just saw, I told you several stories during this presentation. People remember things better with stories. You're going to remember that macaroni grill has paper <laughs> tablecloths and that you can draw database diagrams on them. It's just, that's what's gonna happen. But would you remember if I told you that 90% of the people will never remember what I say? No, you won't remember the fact. It's a story that makes the difference. So anytime you can put your stuff in a story form, that's a better presentation. Whatever you can do to put it in story form, that's a good presentation. And that's not easy if you're doing a technical deep dive or something like that, it's not easy. But the more you can put little story hints in there, the better, okay? Gather your facts, get all of your information. Do not be afraid of not having all the information, okay? That will sink a presentation more than anything else. And trust me, your first presentation, you'll go way too far. Everybody does, you'll go way too far. You'll be like, yep, I researched the last five versions of SQL Server, and I know that it won't do this in all of these five versions. Yeah, nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> nobody could care. Or if you knew that in SQL Server 7, it didn't do this. Well, that's, luckily there's none of those left. Um, <laughs> let's not talk about 4-2 and the insurance company that still has it out in Texas. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, study, gather your facts, study and prepare your slides. Now, what does this mean by study and prepare your slides? This is where I said, I literally sat on a blank slide that said why for four days. <laughs> I was studying my slides. I try to put my slides together in random form, not on purpose, but I get ideas and I put them together into different pieces and then I'll shuffle and organize them around. Well, if I've got a slide that's a barrier to me, it just sits there. It says why and it just sits there. And that's where I study and prepare my slides and I try to figure out how am I gonna put this in there? How am I gonna do this? Make sure you take the time. 
pictures are great. Pictures are wonderful to add onto your slides because you don't really want them to read all of your slide content. You want them to hear what you're saying. So pictures are good, but finding those pictures are a lot more difficult than you think. <laughs> you can spend a lot of time looking for pictures. Luckily, I'm a photographer and I use most of my own pictures, but <laughs> no, and I'm not out there in the world taking a picture like, this will be great for that slide tomorrow. No, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I just find things that work. Okay, present to an empty room. I cannot stress this enough. Like I said, I have presented this presentation twice to an empty room, and I kid you not, I've said every word. The reason you say it is because the more you say it, the more you memorize it, the more you know it, the more it makes it easier to say again. So don't just go and sit down and like, okay, I'm gonna say this, and I'm gonna say this, and I'm gonna say these things. No, no, no. You've gotta stand here, you've gotta to speak to an empty room. And if you've got a dog or a husband or a wife or somebody that can talk to, great. You know, it might be boring to them, but if you can do it, then present to them. But if not, an empty room works just fine. And I use conference rooms at my office all the time. I will just grab a conference room, I'll hook up my project, I mean my computer to projector, and I will go through the slides and I'll talk just like this. Well, that will also show you stuff that's not working and things you shouldn't say. Exactly, and I will time myself. I will also use a timer or something else. A lot of the slides do that for you. So you know how long the presentation actually is. What you'll do on your first presentation as well is you will go too long. You will put too much information into your first presentation. I guarantee it. So go in there and time yourself and then you'll know exactly what kind of time. You should also run through your demos. Don't just say, there's gonna be a demo and I know how to do that. Oh, did I still do the next 100? No jumping ahead. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Erase that from your memory. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Run through things. Practice, practice, practice. And if it is your first time, honestly, two or three times speaking to an empty room is a good idea at least. Even if it's, so Andrew's about to do the speaker idol or the lightning talks. Lightning talks are only about 15 minutes or so, right? We're doing 10 minutes, 10 minutes. So that's good. But you got to understand it's actually hard to get into 10 minutes. Okay. You got to think about one concept, one idea, one demo, and that's it. That's 10 minutes. So you've got to limit yourself down to that and you've got to practice it if you're really going to get under the 10 minutes. Okay, so keep that in mind when you're doing your lightning talks. Present to others, like I said, if you've got others to present to, great. Most people will just fall asleep while you're trying to talk if they don't like technical things. <laughs> All right, gosh, that keeps skipping. Look at that, I can't even get to the right one. I need a new clicker. All right, yes, demonstrations, demos. What do you do? Well, it's pretty self-explanatory. You test, <laughs> you test over and over again. And I have a story behind this one, one of my favorite ones. Ben's not even here. How can I pick on Ben? Oh my gosh. Oh, I'm picking on him. <laughs> so I, then I've got two stories really quick. Um, one of them was SQL Saturday. There's lots and lots of SQL Saturdays. We had a great gentleman here in the Valley that went to 20, 30 SQL Saturdays. Wonderful presenter, expert at what he did. He got there in the morning, he was all ready to go, he was testing his demo, he literally tested his demo during the first session and he was on the next session. The next session, it bombed. The demo actually died. <laughs> and it was a version upgrade or something else that had happened in between sessions. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> and this is a pro that does this all the time. It happens to everybody. So test it as much as you possibly can, but there's a simple rule when a demo goes bad. Apologize once, try to fix, and move on. That's it. Don't say a million times, I am sorry, this did not work, okay? Do not do it. All people will remember is that you were sorry that they had a bad presentation. You could have made the best presentation in the world, but you said you're sorry about the demo, that's all they're gonna remember. Say apologize once, move on, done. That's it, yes, Steve. I'm sorry, I, I keep on talking, but I have been mortified a couple times. So I had one where I was a de demo where I was doing comparison using some Braingate tools, mm -hmm. um, and I was using my Surface, but when your Surface is plugged in, it's lightning fast. When you unplug it, it's dog slow. Yeah. Like it cuts down the processor. Yeah. And so I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh my gosh, this doesn't take this long, this doesn't take long. I'm comparing a two, database, a two table to a zero table mm -hmm. database, so it should be zero. So in my demo, I switched over to the screenshots mm -hmm. because I knew that it was slow, right? And I wouldn't have known it if I didn't hit the third or fourth test on that. 
Yeah, but and that's and that's the other important thing, have a backup. That's what Steve is talking about right here. If you have this in a Docker container, if you have this in a virtual machine, if you have it on a USB, something else. We've had conferences where people forgot their entire laptops. And they're like, well, I've got my presentations on a USB. Great, you can use mine. That might work, you know, something like that. There's things that can work if you've got a backup. You don't have to necessarily take three laptops with you like certain SQL family members do. <laughs> um, but you've got to have something that has some sort of backup. Screenshots is a great way to do it. You say, okay, my backup, I mean, my presentation failed, the demo failed, here's my screenshots, let's go forward. So make sure you do those things. Yes? I don't know if you'll cover this later, but another important thing about demos is stay on the old brick road. <laughs> yes, don't code directly inside a demo or something like that. So somebody will ask a question, what happens if you do this in class? Really cool. you know, so I think, I think I mentioned that in one more slide too, but yes, yes, absolutely. If you have a demo or something else, you have to make the call, can I code or write directly in a demo? Some people can, some people have the ability to stand up here and type away, and they won't type form instead of from nine million times. Okay. Yeah, I don't have that ability. <laughs> I would just say as a general rule, nobody wants to see you type. Exactly, yeah, you know, paste. Save it, save it yep. else Run the pieces, absolutely. And if it goes to, hey, let's try this, if you've got a long session, you've got a day workshop or something, then you go off to the try this and you have time. If you're in a simple session, don't do it. Just don't do it. Okay, so let me make sure that I didn't. Okay, so day of, and then I'm gonna talk about a few more things during the presentation. There's one more slide for that. Day of prep, please go see your organizers, please. I can't say this enough. Check in when you get to registration or anything else. Excuse me, I cannot tell you how many times I have been in the back room of an event and somebody comes to me, there's no speaker. We don't know where they are and we don't know anything about them. So, and it's bad for the attendees, it's bad for the organizers, it's bad for everybody. And things happen. I've had people get in car accidents before my events, I've had people pass away a few days before my events, I've had all sorts of things. There's things you can't control. We don't ever wanna say that's, you know, we're gonna fire you for that or something else, or we're gonna, you know, make you feel terrible for it. We're gonna say, okay, great. Thank you for letting me know. And now how, what can we do to fix this? So always check in with your organizers as soon as you get to the event. Usually there's a sheet or something else or you have a speaker badge. There's some sort of process, but make sure you check in with them. Um, verify your room location and times. This is really important too, is that you go to your room and you actually look at it and you say, okay, this is my room. I know what's in there. Maybe attend someone else's session to watch them. Watch if their projector goes on the fritz. Watch if things don't show up. A great session from that was Code Camp years ago. We had a bulb going out in a projector. And I kid you not, this is not a joke. For some reason, it wouldn't show red letters. It showed everything else but not red letters. And the person that was doing like one of the keynotes had all red type for a lot of his um, coding. And so it literally would say select in yellow and then you couldn't see anything else because it was red and it wouldn't show red. The projector would not show red. I'm like, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. How does it, how does it do this? <laughs> and somehow that happens. So look for things like that, you know, or things that are crazy that are going on in the room. Check your room beforehand. Uh, drink lots of water. I always keep this with me. You won't really see me without it too often. Um, do not drink the sugary sodas. <laughs> If you need a quick pick-me-up or something, an energy work, drink works, an energy shot, whatever, but don't drink a sugary soda. The more that you talk, the more your mouth will gum up as you drink soda. Another person gave me this really, really great thing too is that actually hot tea or even hot water is good. It actually rests your uh, vocal cords and everything. It loosens them up and it makes it easier to talk. I don't like hot tea at all, so I haven't tried it yet, but that's what was suggested from another, another conference organizer. And then of course, test your demos a few more times that day of. Everybody usually has a green room, someplace to put your stuff, test your demos, test those things out right before. If you did something bad, like Windows Update the night before, that's really, really bad, don't ever do that. <laughs> but if you did, then you can test your demos and see if they're not working anymore, because they're not. <laughs> it's Windows Update, nothing ever works. Okay. Man, this is like slow to move. You know what? It's because I'm not plugged in, I bet you. <laughs> or Google or something. So presentation time. So what do you do when you actually get up here and you're standing up here and everything else? I don't know is an acceptable answer. If, if you follow it up. The best thing to do is say, 
Steve, I really don't know the answer to that question right now, but let me get back with you later, or if you want, hit me up or send me your email and I will look up that information and tell you about it. Or if you have a blog or a Twitter account or something, I'll say, I will post it later on. Make sure you come up to me afterwards and let me know what that is. A lot of people will keep a piece of paper or a pad right here too and keep track of those people in those comments. So I don't know is acceptable as long as you follow it up with something. Don't just flat out say, I don't know, okay? Give something more. Yeah. Where are you going to? I didn't know. Oh. <laughs> I was, Paul Randall is very good at that. Yes, yes. Well, and Paul and Kimberly he are the ones. He says he doesn't know. Right. By first step. Second, right. he's just going to move past. Well, Kimberly is the one that taught us to, to follow up with I don't know. She's actually the one that taught the idea of that concept years ago and using the pad. Because she would always write down people's emails or those questions, and then she would blog about it later. So she actually used to have sessions where she'd have a session and then you'd see a blog post with 15 questions that were asked and she put them up there. Um, I don't typically keep that close of a pad and everything else for those questions, but people can come up afterwards and that works. So repeat the question. Very, very important to repeat the question. If you are on an online um, situation like we are now, right now you need to repeat the question so that everybody in the room can hear it. You also understand the person's question better if you repeat it. So always repeat the question whether you're online or not. If you're online, it's even easier if you repeat the question. And this one gets me a lot. I hate this because I'll have um, rooms that somebody's on the mic but nobody else is and it's hard to hear the question and it's terrible. So repeat it. Um, be comfortable. I like t-shirts and jeans and most conferences I wear t-shirts and jeans. If you're going to a conference that requires something like a suit, Great, you have to wear a suit, be ready, be comfortable, do whatever that is necessary to do that. But most conferences, they want you to wear their shirt or something else and be comfortable up there. Don't wear tight fitting clothes, don't wear something that you're uncomfortable in. If you're gonna try to do this on a dress, make sure you're ready for that, like a princess dress or something. You know. <laughs> no, wardrobe malfunction. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Be comfortable. Like I said, you want to be up here and relax. You don't want to add any other stress to your mind already that you've already got. Uh, plug in your computer, like Steve said. It's very important. Funny enough, I am not plugged in right now, and I still got another presentation to do. So we'll see how this goes tonight. Um, eyes up and on your audience. So a very important thing to do. You've all seen me. I'm standing here. I'm moving around a little bit. Some people like moving around. Some people don't. If you want to move around on stage, the most important thing you can do is a thing called blocking. Blocking means that I know that if I walk from here, here, I'm not going to fall off the stage, I'm not going to run into anything, and I'm not going to step on anybody. So you find that out before. When you get up on stage, you look, and you say, okay, I can go from there to there, and you kind of practice, and you say, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm okay. That way you know that you're always there. And so now when I do it, I don't have to worry about looking down. I know that I'm safe. I'm not going to run into anything. I'm not going to fall off the stage. Do that whenever you get up there, if you're a big mover. <laughs> if nothing else, you should always be standing up. Never sit down behind your computer for a long per period of time. If you're typing a quick script or something else, fine, but never for a long period of time. You need to be up and eyes on your audience. If they're not in, I mean, if you're not interested, they're not gonna be interested. And then the act of keep things moving is really about the, the what I said earlier. Say you're sorry for your demonstration once, if that happens, and then move forward. If someone is monopolizing time with questions, it is very nice to say, thank you, Andrea, I really appreciate that question, but can we talk about this afterwards because we've got to continue moving forward with the session. Please come and see me right afterwards. The other important thing is after your presentation, get off the stage. <laughs> this is an organizer one that we hate, is that if you stand on the stage and all of these people are swarmed around you, which will happen, the next person can't get set up. So. Do your other fellow presenters a solid favor and you know step off the stage. Hey, let's go out to the hall. It's not hard. Grab your stuff. Say, everybody follow me out to the hall. We'll talk till the cows come out. Okay? All right. Any other comments on presentations during the time? I just thought of something. I can't remember if I've done this or not before. But um, if you know someone, it will be a note taker for you. Mm -hmm. That can lift off you having to write down questions. That's true, yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely a good, good point. If you've got somebody that wants to take some of those questions for you, perfect. Yeah, absolutely. And there's definitely sometimes when a presenter, another presenter will help you. Because again, they want to see it or they're in the next session. Or if you ask them while they're sitting there, sure, no problem. Great idea. I'm sorry, I'm going to add to that. Have your emotional buddy. Oh, yes. If, it's, if you're nervous or if you're, if you're scared, have your emotional right. buddy, someone that you know, 
sit in the audience, and then if you get a heckler or someone that's difficult with questions, mm -hmm. your buddy can help you. Yeah, get that move to another question or something else. Yeah. Something else. Or you can just you can just push to them, right? Like, well, what do you think? <laughs> well, I mean, I know that that sounds kind of like uh, like uh, my a, my I, boss I, keeps doing it to me constantly. If you're not if you're not real comfortable up there, and you have somebody you say, well, let's ask this person, or let's what do you guys think? And kind of push it back on the crowd, yeah. and then while that conversation is happening, you can kind of Move gather forward. yourself and say, okay. This is great. I think this is great. Let's talk about it after and mm -hmm. we'll move on, right? Yep. Otherwise, yeah. you get into kind of a conversation that turns into a heated conversation, and then people are like, what's happening? Right. As the speaker and presenter, you do have to control the flow of the session. In other words, if it goes really long, as much as people say, well, he went really long or they went really long, yeah, that is the um, presenter's responsibility to not go long. It's, it really comes down to them. So um, I'm interested that nobody called me out on my alcohol picture. It's kind of funny, but <laughs> I wanted to bring it back up because I forgot to mention that the reason this is prep is because I run quite a few little parties at my house and stuff like that, bartend for them. That was prep for one of the parties. And so uh, that's why it became the prep picture for that. I thought, I was like, why did nobody call me out on a whole bunch of bottles of alcohol? I mean, that should be. I thought that was just normally your counter. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. And he had to have the data. Well, I had to identify how many of those bottles I actually had. It. Exactly, right, right. These two are wondering what the. We're going to tell a story eventually about not drinking that much before presenting. That's a great idea. That's a good point too. Yes, yes. This is, should not be your day of prep. You should not drink this right before. <laughs> That's yeah. the post event, right? Exactly. That's that's how you relax. Good. I'm going to change my presentation for that later. All right. So one of the last things I've got here is feedback and follow up. The one of the hardest things. Understand that when you submit that button, when you hit at, when you hit submit abstract. You've now just accepted criticism from other people, period. You are about to put yourself on stage and you're about to get told that you are terrible. It's that simple. It will happen. It's going to happen. Um, I tell the story that my very few, my, my very first few presentations bombed. <laughs> Back in SQL Server 2005 days, I was a terrible presenter. And it took me a long time to get better. But it took some feedback from people to say, you know, you didn't do a very good job. It wasn't constructive feedback, but it was still feedback. You have to accept that. As soon as you hit that button, you get ready. So what I always tell my presenters, the most important thing is to put your armor on. The hardest day for me every year is the Sunday after an event. And that is because I read the feedback for my event. It's very, very difficult. <laughs> it's a hard day, but I know how to put my armor on. I know how to take those things and I know how to do that. But that's the point is the same thing that Andrew has mentioned with emotional or anything else. You have to be realizing that once you hit that button, someone's not going to like your presentation. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that, but you have to accept it. And there are people that can find something to complain about regardless of how perfect the event is. Correct. Correct. So the follow-up, too, is blog about it, talk about it, put things out there and say, hey, this was a great presentation I did. Let other people know about it in the community. This is not just about fueling ego or anything else or trying to get you a job, this is also because you're going to help the community because that presentation is out there. Somebody else can use that in the future to learn something. That's a good thing. Um, and then follow up with the attendees if you had any questions around that too. Follow up with any of those things. Giving good feedback is very important too. Once you stand up here and you get a presentation, the next time you give feedback to a presenter, think about it. <laughs> <laughs> think about not only what you would want to hear, but how do you improve it? I am very, very constructive when I give feedback, but I'm also very honest. If somebody says, hey, you know, this presentation did work or it didn't work, I don't say things like, you suck. That will come up, trust me. <laughs> um, I say things like, you know, you really, you moved around great, but you moved around a little too much. Or I think the, you lost your audience at this point when you're talking about these things. Maybe your slides were too wordy. You hit a few snags. You need to practice it. Probably the most number one thing that I give feedback to all my teams that come to me is you need to practice because there's still a ton of developers and engineers and database administrators that come out there and they just say, well, I'm just going to start typing and show you how to do something. When it comes to a presentation, you've got to do more than that. That's good for someone sitting at your desk, but when it comes to a presentation, it needs to be more. 
And we had that a lot at Open West. Yeah. Can I um, add something about receiving feedback? It's it, it obviously is hard to receive feedback, but I always have to take a step back and go and remind myself, focus on the facts, not the emotions, mm -hmm. and, and sort through it and pull the facts out myself so that I can improve the things that need to yes. legitimately improve and ignore that's a, stuff. that's an excellent way to look at it. Yes, I agree. Yeah, whatever you can do to not only separate it. Now, again, the big problem is, is you need to give that same feedback next time you feedback the presenter. Because, again, some people just put the emotional in there and that's it. Or they say, I hated this session. Or this was completely not what I wanted. I'm like, okay, but you've given no way for us to improve and get better. And you should always improve when you read that feedback. Always. Yes, Steve. I was going to say, uh, also, if you are providing your slides or demos, provide them quickly. Yeah. Don't wait for a week or two weeks to get to them. I mean, get them either get them up on CodeFlex, not CodeFlex. Uh, SlideShare. SlideShare, anything, any way you can. Make it easy, provide the link, have it up before or right after, and update it and get it out. Because, I mean, how, how often do you go back? Yeah, and that's, I'll, I'll show in just a second because I have mine up on SlideShare so you can get to them easily. But, and, and that's another reason that if you create a few presentations, if you have them there, it's a lot easier to easily hand them out. If it was the first time you're doing something, you're like, oh, what do I do with it and how do I do it? I do all that before. When I submit an abstract and then I get my presentation ready, I start to do all those steps before I ever go and give the presentation. And that's the best thing you can do, get it all done before, because if you try to do it after, you'll forget about it. It'll be a day of prep and you'll have too much alcohol and you'll forget. <laughs> okay, maybe that's just me. Um, so resources, here's the resources page. Again, I'm not going to really bother. Um, these are up on slideshare.net. Um, it'll be in the recording, so I'm not going to go through all of these. But these are just some that I collected. This Brent Ozar link is probably one of my favorites because it's got like 10 or 15 articles. And yes, it says 2012, but trust me, this is all still relevant. Yeah, and he's been updating it too. Yeah, yeah. So questions. We've had a great discussion during it, so that's good, but I still put questions up. Yes? Uh, so one of my questions is at the data conference mm -hmm. that happens, I never can remember what it's called. Spring and fall. It seems like a big, long name. Yeah, i got to work on that. <laughs> so with slides, uh, those slides should, is it, is it practice to make those available afterwards? Because last time I didn't see it, so. We have been doing a terrible job of that. That's something that we've failed heavily at, is to, we do not have a system in place for our own event to put them up. So we expect our presenters to do slide share or something else, and we do not communicate that well. Oh, okay. So that's an entire failure on Utah Geek Events part. Yeah, I was just curious. Yeah, what I usually tell people is I say, hey, if you write them an email, they'll happily usually send it to you. You know, They'll have no problem, but, but it should be an event thing that's done. So it is absolutely an improvement we've been trying to make. Um, we do have new website, new technology behind it. That's something we'll probably work on. But now here's an important part. When I talked about community and layoffs and everything else earlier, you should control your own slides. I have a SlideShare account and I have my presentations on there and everything else. You should have that yourself and never depend on an event to do it because it really should be your data and your information. That helps your LinkedIn profile, that helps your blogs, that helps whenever somebody says, what's your resume? You can say, look, I have all these presentations as well that I've done. So a presenter should own it, but an event should post it as well. You know, There should be both of those. Um, and like I said, I'll take full responsibility. The events here have failed. My events have failed, no question. But I strongly suggest as a presenter, you do it yourself. Really good. And I got up there and I, as I was presenting, I started hearing crickets. And any, any time, I mean, I don't know if people were not getting what I was saying, but I started asking them questions. I started still nothing but crickets. I mean, it's just they're like blinking at me. Mm -hmm. Hear them. You know, it was nothing. What would you say to that? What would you do in that situation? What do you do? So to repeat the question is, how do you how do you not only truly engage your audience, but try to get your your audience engaged with you as well. How do you pump up the audience, in other words, so that they start asking questions, they start doing that? First, the problem sometimes is just setting. 
you know, one, if you're starting out in a users group like this, everybody's tired. They've been working all day. They're coming to a users group. It's probably the evening or something else. You're going to get some people that are just playing flat out, out of passion to work on it. So part of that is that. It doesn't always mean that you have to lose everybody though or in the audience. The best thing you can do is try to pull your audience, like you said, between and throughout it. Try to ask those questions, try to ask those statements. Also, I can't say enough for telling a story. When I'm telling my story, you are a lot more engaged because you wanted to hear how the story ended. If you can make a quick story and idea, it makes all the difference in the world. Um, there's a gentleman, uh, start with why, Simon Sinek, or no, it's not him. There's another one that does it, that shows he did a presentation, kind of a TEDx presentation in, um, I think he was in Belgium, and he talks about three different stories. And he starts to tell these stories, and I kid you not, I can't turn away. <laughs> He's a wonderful, wonderful storyteller. And he doesn't even finish them. He leaves you hanging. It's terrible. But he absolutely gets you 100% engaged just by how he tells a story. So for me, what I have done to try to engage people is tell a story and try to um, pull the audience when I need to pull the audience. I also always, always try to tell my audiences, please interrupt me at any time. I never, never, never want you to wait until the end to ask me a question. I want you to do it right now in the discussion in the moment. That keeps everybody more discussing and keeps them going. So when I tell my presenters, you have a 60 minute session, I say leave 15 minutes for Q&A. That doesn't mean I want you to leave 15 minutes for QA. It means plan 15 minutes into your time frame. So that's what I try to do. That's, that's my suggestion. Anybody else have any, Greg? This sounds kind of weird, but uh, if you arrive to your session early, you interrupt your session with a keyboard also. That's, that's a good point, yep. Like embrace the ice like you would not that's an excellent point. Yeah. You really only need like one or two people to like break that ice, and the rest of the crowd will generally follow. You will still have the tired people. Yep. Break the ice with me. I'll laugh really loud. <laughs> That'll help. See, perfect. Andrew. <laughs> you know, I. I forgot one other two. That's that's an excellent one too. I need to add that in here at some point because I would at larger sessions and things I tend to sit in the front row and just kind of hang out before my session. I don't actually stand up here normally. I try to sit down there and talk and chat. Um, another big one is candy. <laughs> um, when I did UVU a lot, there was a tech conference in UVU for the college students. I always took a bag of chocolate with me and they all paid more attention. Um, it's kind of dangerous because you can hit them and you know, you can hit them in the head or something, but I take little miniatures and I'll usually do that to give away candy. That helps. Don't throw pencils in a session. <laughs> Literally that was feedback from one of our things. So. Yeah, anything. Whatever. Yeah. So Something that entices them too. Okay, so so <laughs> all right. I'm gonna wrap this up really quick. <laughs> she finally got it. Nobody called me on it. I said in the meetup that I would provide unicorns and I did not provide any unicorns until the last slide. I did. I did, yes. Um so let's talk about a few things I did wrong during this presentation, and I did this on purpose. So this slide, I'm not a big fan of the Q&A slides because again, I like to do discussions during the, the session. So I don't really need this slide. What I intended was just this slide where we can talk for the next few minutes and talk about all the things and you can still get to my information. You can take a picture of it. You have all that you need. So I always suggest as the last slide is kind of a repeat of your about me slide or your resources slide or something that works to sit there and talk. Know that that slide will sit up there for a while and you'll talk, you'll answer questions, it will happen. So keep in mind what's on that last slide, okay? Um, a couple other things that I missed, made a mistake, this slide, these bullet points are wrong. I like the zero. Yeah, yeah. Um, I left them that way, I've been revamping the whole slide deck and I left them that way to see if anybody picked up that you should keep them consistent. Decide on something, whatever it is, but keep it consistent going through. And I think one of the other ones, no, I didn't do that. So this is important though too, I'll bring this up. If you do not take the picture, make sure you put um, ownership to who the picture belongs to. This is where I got the picture. You can put it in the comments. You don't have to put it on here. But again, as a photographer, I don't want you using my picture without my permission. And so I give credit to where credit is due. And that's why I put that up there. You can put it in the comments too. So by putting it there, that doesn't mean you got permission to use it. No, but you're giving credit to the photographer, at least. Yes. 
Yes, as long as it goes into a very, there's this huge document all about it. Um, and you know, Steve and I have talked about this before too, about what's usable and what's not, things like that. The point is, is that there's different levels of copyright that you can use and you cannot. As long as you're not really making money off of it, giving credit is good. Okay, that's really all you need to be. And I'm not here to make any money off of this consulting or anything else. So at least give credit no matter what. Okay. Wikipedia Commons. Yeah. Wikipedia stores all of its pictures. And you can search just by putting in keywords, just like you can anything else. They have tons of good well, photographs, all sorts of stuff. Technically, you just you do it on it. Uh, Google Image, you can do it too. Google image search, if you just change the filter, there's a filter and it says copyright. And that copyright will give you the option of for profit, not for profit, um, co creative commons, anything else. If you go to creative commons, you can use any picture that comes up in the search. And really, you don't even have to give credit because it's just out there. So that's an, you can do it. Like I said, that's part of the prep time. It can take a long time to do that, to find the right picture. And that's why, again, as a photographer, I like to go to my own library and just pull out whatever I want. You know, you say about the picture, not the picture, but just the general um, feel of the presentation. If you can, try and stick to a topic. Right? Yeah. So don't be bouncing in and out of Lego and Marvel. Right. And just because at that moment you're like, this is the thing I want, right? Like mm -hmm. try and keep it together, even though you might like that stuff, but try and keep it along yep. the same thing. Otherwise, you're going to distract. If you put a picture, like these are obviously presentation bags being laid out. Yes. Probably. But if you, yeah, if you um, put a picture of Captain America up there, right. it's not going to add to your slide deck, and it will probably distract from in the group. So. Right. Which is why this one was so hard <laughs> to figure out. Right. To figure out how to bash on it. So another thing that I did wrong is I read a lot of my slides. I did this on purpose again because I want to show it as one of the topics. You need to try to find a way not to read each bullet point in your slide. I did it on purpose so that you could see the different talking topics that are in there, but try to find a way to tell stories and to, to convey what those topics are, but not read every single line that is on your slide. You'll get comments about that. You'll get statements about that. Okay? Yes? One thing I've seen is you have, might have like five bullet points. They'll actually say the first third or fifth. And everyone else in the audience sees those the second floor. Yeah. And so they're reading at themselves, and so you don't have to. Yeah, that's another way to do it too. Um, also, they can be too busy. Don't do too many bullet points. You know, this one for me is a push. I'm, I'm kind of torn that there shouldn't be that many. Um, this one for sure, obviously, has too many, but it's a joke as well. So this one really doesn't change. But don't do too many bullet points. Not too much text on there. You don't want them reading your slide. You want them listening to you. Borderline almost too small of a font. Oh, yes, that's a good point on some of these slides. It, that one is really hard because you run into different projectors. And it's funny, this is a brand new projector in here. Before, we used to have that little one and everything. So you got to play with the projectors and what you're on. A lot of things are TVs now, too. And TVs have a big impact looking different than a projector. So I totally agree with you. If you can get there earlier, if you can get to the green room, then you can change your template or you can change your font a little bit and update that and change it. Because you've got to be somewhat dynamic with that. It all depends on your audience. And your I like how your, your bullet points are short amounts of words. You don't have like lines and lines and yeah, lines, yeah. like mm -hmm. a paragraph for every bullet point. It's right. just quick idea. Right. I, uh, I totally completely agree. Small bullet points. If you have a lot of content you want to give out, put it in the notes mm -hmm. on that page, yep. right? Because then you can give it to them and say, "There's notes that talk yep. about every single step of setting this up." But here's the high level. That's a. It's an excellent point too about the notes. Is that for things like SlideShare.net, you're watching a presentation that somebody gave, but you're not getting the context of it. Now, part of us say, well, you didn't attend my session, so that's the whole point. You need to be here to really get that context. But a lot of people will put a ton of things in the notes, and then they can still benefit from that moving forward. It's a it's a plus and minus scenario there. You can do both. Um, but just know that if you put something up on like slideshare.net, people are going to see it for a long, long time. And they may be like, okay, why did you have a unicorn picture in the slideshare? And they don't know any of the context behind it. It's funny regardless. So, yes. <laughs> Yeah. 
but also that gives me detailed information if I have to get to it. Otherwise, I can skip over it. That's a good point too, is to use the to use the handouts essentially, give out handouts related to the notes as well. Um, if I do any notes for one of my presentations, I have my book. I'm a bullet journal person, so I always have this with me. And all of my talking points are inside here, essentially on a piece of paper. So if I was not fully practiced for it, or if it was a technical session and I didn't want to forget anything, I would have a list right here. I would have a list of items inside here that I would I would not want to forget, and I would go back and check them as I went through the presentation. You've so. given me the feedback before to not have a demo slide or demo. Exactly. Yes, that's a good one too. Oh, that's. It was that one and one other I was going to mention. So demo, don't say demo time, <laughs> because what if you don't have a demo? What if it fails? What if you lost something before that? You're like, oh, yeah, we'll just skip by that demo. Don't skip slides either. <laughs> don't say, oh, no, we're not going to talk about that slide. No, 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 no. Hide it, delete it, something. Don't talk about it if you're not going to actually talk about it. Um, the other one was I thought I left one in here, but I didn't. Um, page numbers. I'm not a big slide page number person. People then try to figure out, okay, how many do I got left? How many do I got left? <laughs> Sitting there, okay, does he have 70? Does he have 60? I don't like slides with uh, numbers. So this one actually had numbers on the bottom, but I actually cleaned them all off. <laughs> so I meant to leave one on there. That's another thing too, don't leave one on in the middle of the deck. You're like, oh, you're on slide 16, but there's no other numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's exactly what it was, but I cleaned it and I'm like, oh, I should have left that there. Because <laughs> again, I, I, I leave mistakes in here so we can talk about it because it's a presenting deck. That's the idea so that you learn these things. But definitely, if you want to do slide numbers, that's great. For a long, a long day, you know, if you're doing a full day or something like that, it might make sense to, to know those status checkpoints and things like that. But if you've got an audience and they're sitting here looking at the numbers and they're trying to figure out, is he done yet? Is he done yet? You don't want to figure that out. Okay. You want to have them focus on just what you're doing. And if you do get to the point where you're basically just talking in pictures, make sure you full screen them, screen them and you resize them so they fit. You've noticed on mine they're a little oblong in some places, some are this and that. That's because I wanted to convey, convey text and that. If I was just doing pictures, I would make them all full screen and they would just be the pictures and nothing else. That's a hard topic to talk about. I mean, that's a hard presentation to give, but it's it's fun. Okay. All right. And then, most importantly, is always mention, thank you very much for your time. I am now complete. I'm happy to stay back afterwards and talk to you, but thank you for coming. I say that because a lot of the times people will get to this last side and then they'll just keep talking and they won't stop. You need to say, I'm done with my presentation. Thank you all for coming. And then, let them clap, and then if they want to come up and talk, great. Come up and talk. Like I said, go out to the hall. But but make sure you end, okay? Don't just leave them all hanging. Yes, Steve. Uh, I was going to say, you need to end before the end of your session. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because, like, in here, there's an open end, right? Right. I mean, it's not open, but it doesn't, it's not going to hurt anyone to be five minutes late. Right. It's like the session goes over. At, SQL Saturday or SQL Pass or yep. whatever, someone at half, half, half class is going to get them to walk out, yep. and then you don't get to say thank you for coming because exactly. there's too much chaos. Exactly. So if you have your QA slide, if you have your about me slide, if you have something else, end. You know, I say that. I literally will tell people, um, I'm complete with my session. Would love to stay back here and talk more. I would love to talk to you out in the hall, but this session's over. Thank you for coming. And then those who want to leave, leave, and that's great. But those that want to stay, they can talk or something else. Always end. Don't leave people hanging. It's all about communication. Okay. And with that. Everything you were going to cover in your abstract, which is yes. unicorns. Yeah, unicorns, yes. <laughs> I didn't get unicorns. Yeah. So well, I have a question. Yes. If you're done. I'm done. I'm done. Okay. Um, so I'm in the middle right now of trying to write an article. Mm -hmm. And I was going to post it on LinkedIn. And then when I got on LinkedIn, I, I realized that my article was like way too long, it had all kinds of tables and images that you can't really put in there. Mm -hmm. And I'm learning now that, that when you post on LinkedIn, it's just supposed to be something short, maybe one picture of the header, and that's it. And it's different from a paper. So I'm thinking about taking that paper, split into three different LinkedIn posts, mm -hmm. and putting that on there. But I see a lot of, I think, similarities with what you're talking about and how to write a good article mm -hmm. and a good paper. Yeah. 
So do you have any comments just in your experience doing that? Do you write articles? Um, yes, I haven't blogged for quite some time about anything, but but yes, absolutely. And the more you can break down, the more you can separate it out, the better. What I will use for a great example is um, Big Mountain Data and Dev Conference. We have to to explain to people about a hundred different things about when they come to the event. They have to register. They need to know where to go. Schedule everything else. We used to write that in one giant newsletter. Yeah, nobody read it. <laughs> nobody reads. Nobody hardly reads the newsletter now, but. We split it into three parts so that it basically falls on like a Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So we hope people will digest it smaller pieces and, and different steps. So the more you can do that, the better. And honestly, from my perspective, um, culture is doing this more and more. It's like just before we started, all I read was the headline of that article about fry sauce. I didn't read anything else. And you're having that more and more where people are just reading certain little things and not the whole thing. So the more smaller pieces you can get that convey what you're trying to say, the better. And that's what slides are. Slides should not convey an entire story. They should convey a few key points, and you should tell a story about those key points. That's what makes the difference. Just don't do a story every slide, or else you're never going to leave the building, <laughs> depending on how many slides you have. <laughs> I do have one presentation that has four slides, so that works. But <laughs> most presentations, 10 to 15 slides. I've heard of some people that their rule is to do things on one slide at the most. If, and if they can do that, that's great, but I've never been that effective. Well, it depends. I mean, it all depends on the session. I The keynote session I do for the kids event that I talked about in March, I do a keynote for that. That's only eight and a half minutes long. I still have five or six slides that I talk about different things, but the session is only eight and a half minutes long. So I talk for only that. And as long as you time it and you can get to that, then you know exactly what you're doing. But I would say if you're trying to fill a 45-minute presentation or a 60-minute presentation with one slide, you better have some serious storytelling abilities you know, or get ready to tell a big story. I wouldn't even do that. That's my point. I would break it up into little pieces. The reason I did three stories is it broke them apart into separate pieces. And so breaking things down is always helpful. One giant narrative nobody's going to listen to. You know, so. Thank you. Yep. All right. Thanks, everybody.